is currently postdoctoral fellow in the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture at Harvard University. Zahra specializes in medieval Islamic art and architecture with a focus on the Jazeera region, uh, the upper, everybody should know the Jazeera, but the upper uh, areas of Mesopotamia overlying northern Iraq, uh, northeast Syria, and eastern Turkey. She's interested in the social and ritualistic contexts in which objects were perceived and consumed, especially expressions of religious piety, mysticism, and magic. Her doctoral dissertation examined the arrangement of written words in geometric patterns and placed them within the medieval scientific, magical, and popular imagination. Her research project at Harvard focuses on a large stucco panel from the mosque of Runadin Zangi in Mosul, Iraq. While the mosque no longer survives because of the recent ISIS invasions to the city, the panel, currently housed at the National Museum of Baghdad, sheds light on the rich artistic and cultural heritage of 12th and 13th century Mosul. Sahara completed the BA from the University of Texas at Austin. She has an MA from the Institute of the Study of Muslim Civilizations, Aga Khan University, and a second MA from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. And the, sorry, um, she also has extensive museum experience, including with the Aga Khan Museum, the British Museum, and the Royal Ontario Museum. She recently defended her PhD from the University of Victoria, Canada in November 2022. And uh, this was supported by a Joseph Armand Bombardier Scholarship, part of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the SSHRC. So in this evening's lecture, Zahra looks at visual compositions created using Arabic script in 12th and 13th century Mosul in northern Iraq. And we're all going to have fun trying to read those inscriptions with her. Uh, it takes the case uh, of a large stucco panel from the mosque of Nuruddin Zangi, designed with knotted interlacing and framing inscriptions. Focusing on the extra linguistic meanings of the script, the discussion will place the intricately crafted script patterns as part of the surge of magical practices in the Jazeera, uh, as well as the aesthetic outlook of metaphorical imagery and the rich artistic heritage of Mosul. So the title of Zahra's lecture this evening is Crafting Metaphors, Rethinking Arabic Script Patterns as Apotropea in Medieval Mosul. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking Professor Roxborough, Professor Najipolu, and my colleagues here at Fatima, Alia, and Susanna, who allowed me to brainstorm some of my ideas with them. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Aga Khan program for the opportunity to have me here at Harvard and present some of my findings. Um, and to you all, of course, for attending on this snowy February evening. So um, one of the guiding questions of my research, both in my doctoral work and in my postdoc project here, has been the question, what do we see when we look at writing? In my doctoral research, I examined Arabic script arranged in geometric patterns, such as quadrilaterals and circles, and the possible meanings for such images in the for the medieval viewer. For my project here, I continue to explore images where Arabic script is harnessed in ways that produce complex visual compositions. In the images that I will discuss today, I'm most interested in the sinuous labyrinthic designs where the letter stems and ligatures of Arabic script or pseudoscript are extensively manipulated. They stretch, overlap, and interweave. The resulting image appears as knotted motifs and intricate interlacing patterns instinctively drawing in the viewer by turning word into image. 
The words and phrases on the objects appear in both linear and non-linear orientations, resulting in perpendicular, parallel, and curved constructions. In these patterns, the elongated and intersecting strokes of the letters take on a prominent visual character, privileging the shape, the knot, or, or the labyrinthic design, as opposed to the legibility of the text. The malleable ligatures further challenge the readability of the words, at times perhaps a deliberate attempt by the craftsman to render the words indecipherable. The compositions become better suited to be viewed instead of being read. Such patterns constructed solely using script operate at the interstices of word and image. They're crafted using a notation system with a discernible verbal meaning. Yet they either defy a strict linear right to left reading as in the top image or carry elaborate visual ornamentation that becomes the central focus of the script as in the bottom image. In both the script patterns, the image is likely to be grasped before the text is read. In their conflation of visual, graphic, and verbal elements, script patterns squarely fit within the genre of diagrams. Like the script patterns, diagrams privilege the image, although they can include both word and image components. Studies on diagrammatic images highlight the semantic value of visual and graphic elements in knowledge production and processes. That is, meaning is generated not just by what was written, but also how it was written. My discussions today pay attention to the extra-linguistic meanings of Arabic script, placing them within the context of sociocultural and aesthetic practices. I will look at some examples from the region of the Jazeera in the 12th and 13th centuries before the Mongol conquest of the region, focusing on the city of Mosul. The primary focus of my study is a large tripartite panel of molded and intricately carved stucco that survives in a fragmentary form and today resides at the National Museum in Baghdad. The carving on the panel presents a series of niches, columns, and medallions composed and ornamented using Arabic script, enriched with scrolls of vegetation and interlaced patterns. Of primary interest to me is the Arabic script, in particular the extensive manipulation of letter forms and ligatures consciously designed to form specific patterns and decorate architectural features. A cursory glance at the panel will rarely reveal the copious presence of text that almost camouflages with the vegetal and interlaced ornamentation. The stucco work, in fact, incorporates a varied array of epigraphic patterns that become visible to the viewer only upon closer examination. This panel was part of a mosque setting. The Mosque of Nuruddin Zangi in Mosul, constructed between 1170 and 1172. The Mosque of Nuruddin, also known as Al Nuri Mosque, was one of Mosul's three great mosques in the medieval period. The structure included a prayer space and a madrasa, and was known for its leaning minaret the tallest minaret in all of Iraq. The mosque has undergone several phases of additions and reconstructions throughout its history. More recently, in the 1940s, the mosque was demolished and reconstructed under the aegis of the Iraqi Department of Antiquities. It was during this time that the stucco panel was moved to the National Museum in Baghdad, where it is currently housed. In June 2017, this mosque and the minaret were destroyed in an explosion. On the screen is a black and white photograph of the mosque structure prior to the 1940 reconstruction, depicting a faceted conical dome. The original structure, however, was a hemispherical dome as illustrated in the reconstruction. Um, this wide plan was common in Syrian and Jazirian mosques of the period, modeled after the Great Mosque of Damascus, but with a Seljuk-style dome. Four meter high panel is comprised of three sections a tall central frieze flanked by lateral structures. The columns and the arches within the panel are, are decorated with reversed Y and Z motifs, geometric interlacing creating six pointed stars, stylized trefoil leaves, pine cones, and vegeta vegetation scrolls filled with cross hatch incisions. The inscriptions within the facade also include an assortment of script styles, 
In addition to the knotting and interlacing components, there's a square Kufic panel, um, as well as different styles of Kufic and cursive script. Although the script in this richly decorated stucco is presented as medallions, trilobe niches, and ornamenting architectonic elements, the epigraphic program is entirely legible and carries pious names and phrases from the Quran. I would like to illustrate in detail a few of the script patterns. <coughs> on the central panel, the word Muhammad is skillfully crafted on one of the inner spandrels. Not only does the word replace the geometric construction of the panel, but the, le- but the ligatures are extended and interlaced to populate the space within the architectural feature. The word Muhammad is repeated four times, positioned at different angles with extensive interlacing visible along the diagonal axis. In this diagram, each of the four repetitions of the word are treated as an independent unit, and the interlacing occurs between the first two and the last two letters of the word, that is, between the mim ha and the mim del. Although they survive in fragments, the two panels that flank the central piece appear to be similar, though not identical. Only one of the framed circular medallion that occupies the upper zone of the lateral structures is partially intact, but enough to provide a sense of its contents. The central word reads Allah. The word Muhammad is then rendered six times, each word taking up one-sixth of the circular pattern. The base of the letters and the ligatures are elongated to form the circumference of the circle while the vertical extensions of the letter ha form heart-shaped knotted motifs that decorate the inside of the circle. The letter mim is arranged to form an inner ring of the circle, framing the word Allah through a six-pointed star. According to Tariqa Jenabi, who conducted a survey of medieval Iraqi architecture, this is a first instance of a completely epigraphic medallion in northern Iraqi visual culture. Looking at the lower zone on the right, the tympanum on this lateral panel is formed and decorated using the word Muhammad three times. The base of the letters through a clockwise orientation is manipulated to represent the architectural structure. As seen in the previous examples, the vertical components of the letters are extended towards the center to form the interlace and knotted motifs. There is a tri-lobed knot in the center, and two heart-shaped knots conspicuously depicted inside the triangular frame. The niche just below this is composed using the word Fesayak fi Allah, translated as God is sufficient for you, or God will protect you. This is known to be the longest word in the Quran, Surah 2, verse 137. And you can see here how the baseline of the letters takes the form of a trilobe niche. Heart-shaped knots also appear on the middle panel, featuring prominently as an integrated element of the letters Lam Alif in the word Allah, the central eye-catching image of the panel. They can also be seen as part of another word pattern just below, Fesayak Fikahum Allah. In examining these arrangements, what is most apparent, and likely the aim of the craftsman, is the emergence of the visual patterns and motifs that become the focal point of the design, as meaningful as the content of the words themselves. This visual performance of script in deliberate deliberate patterns necessitates a questioning of the intention and motivations behind its prevalence. The panel mimics a mihrab in a mosque, but the panel is not a mihrab. It is a two-dimensional decorative structure that was placed above the mihrab and below the dome, inside the prayer space. The panel was thus not accessible to the viewer at eye level. Rather, one would have to raise their head and look up in order to see the arresting images. Even then, given the height at which the panel is placed within the prayer space, it would have been impossible for the viewer to deconstruct the individual components of this craftsmanship with a single glance. When Ernst Herzfeld, the German archaeologist who documented much of Iraqi architectural heritage in the early 20th century, visited Mosul and the Anuri Mosque, 
He mentions in his diaries the extraordinarily rich stucco decoration of Kufic letters and ornament on the upper walls above the mihrab. He notes the lack of windows and natural lighting, claiming that the decoration was very difficult for him to see and therefore document. The stucco work also has traces of color, which is neither mentioned by Hertzfeld, nor is it visible in photographic images. According to Yasser Taba, who observed the piece in the 1980s, the stucco composition has traces of light blue in the background and ochre. The facade has not been the subject of extensive scholarly discussions, and much of the conversation revolves around the dating of the panel. Hertzfeld and Taba attribute the piece to the mid-13th century as part of a later addition to the mosque during the period of Badruddin Lulu, who is an Anatolian Armenian slave of the Zangids in the mid-13th century, rising to the position of an independent ruler in the city of Mosul. Robert Hillenbrand and some of the recent research conducted by the Czech Academy of Sciences place the panel contemporary to the construction of the mosque, that is, during the time of the Zangid ruler Nur ad-Din in 1172. The carving technique of the stucco decoration, especially the details of the vegetal scrolls created by drilling or incising the plaster, is reminiscent of the stucco styles witnessed in 9th century Samara, labeled as style A. The panels also exhibit strong stylistic similarities with stucco decoration from Seljuk, Iran of the 11th and 12th centuries. This includes extensive use of epigraphy and different styles of epigraphy, trilobed leaves with honeycomb patterns, the geometric interlace forming star shapes, um, and Y and Z patterns, patterns on the columns, as well as the use of knots, among other elements. One may only look at the stucco decoration at the Great Mosque of Nain or the mosque in Ardistan to find comparable levels of craftsmanship. The influence of Iran does not come as a surprise given the presence of Seljuk descendants in the Jazeera region, in mostly administrative spaces and positions of power, and the mass movement of people westwards at the brink of the Mongol invasions in Iran. I want to mention here a few noteworthy exam uh, comparisons to the Anuri stucco with its Seljuk counterparts. First is a symmetrical layout of the design on a diagonal axis, which is common in Seljuk stucco decoration in both epigraphy and vegetal designs. The drawing on the top is from an arch above one of the corner mihrabs in the Master de Paminar in Zavare. A similar emphasis on the diagonal axis in the Mosuli stucco exhibits a strong parallel with the Eastern materials, especially in terms of navigating space and composition. Second, in many of the Seljuk mosques, Arthur Uppen Pope mentions that the white stucco stood out against a blue background. This is consistent with Yasser Taba's observations on the Nurid panel, where traces of blue paint signal an Eastern reference. My third point relates to the use of epigraphy. In my research on Mosul and the Jazeera, I have not come across the phrase Fasa Yakfika Homala anywhere else in the 12th and 13th centuries. However, it does appear on some of the Seljuk period mosques, such as seen here in the mosque at Nine, though not in the shape of a niche. The phrase in a niche shape, however, becomes common in later Ilkhanid period luster mihrabs and coins. An experimentation with the use of names in patterns as in the Anuri Mosque, can also be seen in the innovative decorative scheme of the Great Mosque of Gold Paigan, where the name of Allah, Muhammad, and the Rashidun Caliphs intersect to form a star shape. Looking at some of the trends in Seljuk stucco decoration puts the Nurid designs in perspective, illustrating the intricate details in script and ornamentation as an extension and development of stucco design. Yet, the patterns of the Anuri Mosque are clearly unique and distinct from its Seljuk counterparts, and I have yet to find comparable script patterns in Seljuk, Iran. For the use of undulating lines and the prominence of knots seen in the Nurid decoration, the Jazeera provides plentiful examples. In Mosul and Jazeera, during the 12th and the 13th centuries, the serpent or the dragon with long, winding, knotted bodies were commonplace. Acknowledging the multivalent meanings of this image, 
Scholarship is consistent on the magical and the apotropaic mean functions of this image, seen in recent discussions by Sarah Kuhn and Persis Burlikamp. By magic, I mean the, cap the capability of supernatural or hidden forces, whether celestial or religious, to affect the material world. A subset of magic, apotropaea, is the capability of images to avert evil, the most popular of which are the evil eye amulets. Serpent dragons with knotted bodies were understood as forces of evils and power and worked through the mechanism, like counters like. One of the most well-known of these images is that of the Talisman Gate in Baghdad, which depicts a seated prince flanked by dragons. The dragons are rendered in a symmetrical fashion facing the prince and one another, with their bodies composed of several twists and turns. In particular is the use of a pretzel or the heart-shaped knot, which I've highlighted. In the regions governed by the post-Seljuk successors, um, such as in Aleppo, Damascus, Sinjar, Konya, and Diyarbakir, amongst others, dragons were often depicted as mirror images or in pairs, most commonly seen on thresholds, such as entrances, portals, doorways, and gates. The areas, these areas were, were were vulnerable places where demons and evil spirits could reside, and they needed to be protected. The use of knotted serpent dragons permeated in 12th and 13th century stone architecture. Other examples include the entrance gate to the citadel in Aleppo, which was commissioned by the Ayyubid Sultan as Zahir Ghazi. This was the first entrance gate of several into the monument and was named the Gate of Serpents. The gate of Badruddin Lulu's caravanserai, located on the road between Mosul and Sinjar, depicts a human figure slaying a dragon. It's the image on the uh, right at the bottom. A motif especially popular in Seljuk, Anatolia. Similar to the depictions on the Nurid stucco decoration, it is noteworthy that the dragon bodies feature on architectural elements such as lintels and spandrels and are placed in an elevated location. I also want to draw your attention here to the deliberate twisting and knotted forms of the serpentine bodies that has further prompted scholars to interpret such materials as holding talismanic properties. The motif also appears in Jaziran metalwork with themes parallel to architectural decoration, seen here from both Mosul and Anatolia. The heart-shaped knot on the, on the materials mirrors the central knot on the Nurid stucco. The undulating knotted body is also particularly pronounced in materials with explicit magical affiliations, such as in the manuscript of the Dakaik al Hakaik that deals with magic astrology and talismans. In Anatolia, such images of the dragon body with an equestrian slayer are a common feature of Byzantine silver amulets, often associated with Solomon, as well as with, equ with equestrian saints such as St. George. Magical associations of the intertwined serpent also appear in Islamic period jewelry, where the knotted motif appears in concert with a seated lion. And on this ring, um, the phrase Alez Walik Bel, glory and prosperity, serving as a harbinger of good luck to the one who wears it. The connection between knots, magic, and supernatural significance has a history that transcends time and geography. The ancient practice of tying knots and blowing on them was a way of binding together magical and supernatural powers. The use of knots is seen as clearly as a pharaonic period in Egypt in textual amulets made from papyrus and linen. Knots can be witnessed in incantation bowls from Babylonia, as well as seen in magic medicinal bowls from the Jazeera region. Knots and interlaces were also one of the most frequent motifs on textiles from Byzantine Egypt, protecting the living and the dead, such as seen in this example of a textile fragment from the Metropolitan Museum with an interlacing medallion. Studies highlight the use of ornamental patches, such as this one, that were often placed on specific parts of the bodies prone to pain and discomfort. Michael Camille, in his discussion of magic in medieval Europe, describes the knot as a, quote, magical visual form par excellence, unquote. Rich, uh, rituals of knot blowing as indicative of magic have also been mentioned in the Quran. The presence of knots was thus widely known and symbolic of healing, protection, and supernatural powers. 
A 14th century theologian goes so far as to define the Arabic word tilsam, talisman, as an indissoluble knot. The presence of dragons and their knotted bodies was so ubiquitous that rarely did one need the entire iconographic image to decipher its presence and efficacy. As such, not only do the bodies of the dragons visually occupy a greater surface area compared to its head, but the heads also become visually insignificant. This interplay with the knotted bodies leads to an abstraction or stylization of the motifs. For instance, the Sultan Han in Kayseri, a resting place featuring a kiosk mosque, is a good example. On the entrance of this mosque, the arch is decorated with abstracted bodies, the heart-shaped knot here stylized to form a heart. On the image on the right, you see an entrance portal from the monastery of Mar Benam, a Syrian Orthodox monastic complex located 35 kilometers south of Mosul. This space also included a shrine dedicated to Khidr, revered by Muslims for possessing mystical knowledge. I must make note that while Mosul was governed by Muslim rulers, first by the Zangids and then independently by Badruddin Lulu, the city also had a large Christian population. And Mosul is often described as a characteristic example of Muslim Christian syncretism. The Mar Benam Monasteries is especially known for its association with miraculous cures and visited by both Christians and Muslims in the 13th century. One of the gates in the Mar Benam depicts a series of niches, by, uh, which are formed using the bodies of serpents, intersecting with one another through the use of knots. Like in the other examples, the bodies are highlighted, while the heads almost become insignificant. Some of the other entrances in this complex also have inscriptions in Syriac, along with knotted dragon bodies and lions. One of them reads, quote, Hail to thee, O holy Benam, blessed martyr, hail to thee and thy sister Sarah. Whoever crosses thy threshold is in total safety, unquote. A similar theme is also repeated on another gate, which reads, this gate is a gate of mercy, and he who enters shall find mercy, unquote. The inscriptions here reinforce the doors, the gates, and the thresholds as liminal sites and where protection may be sought. An identical border of niches enclosed, encloses a stone mihrab that, was, that likely um, was the original mihrab of the great mosque of Anuri in Mosul. This series of niches have examples in the region's city walls and in the interiors of mausoleums as well. And while they're interpreted to possess a range of meanings, one cannot discount their role as apotropaea. The presence of apotropaic imagery in mosque and shrine architecture was a common feature of 12th century Jazeera and neighboring regions. Literary accounts of the period, such as that of Ibn Asakir, discuss the proliferation of talismans in the Great Mosque of Damascus in the 12th century, particularly against snakes and scorpions, but also rats and spiders, and is discussed in depth by um, Joseph Mary and Finbar Flood. A quick comparison of the notes of the knots seen on the dragon body, which is illustrated on the upper half of the screen, and I've isolated the knots here from the Talisman Gate, the Aleppo Citadel, and Badruddin Lulu's caravanserai. Comparing these knots with those incorporated in the stucco panel in question, the lower half of the screen, illustrates that the style of the knots is identical. The pretzel or heart-shaped knot formed using two loops and creating three points of intersection. Returning to the panel under question, the heavily ornamented and labyrinth-like frieze makes extensive use of knotted motifs and interlacing, leading one to question whether in fact the use of letter bodies in this way might reference the bodies of serpent dragons. Even the central bolded epigraphic motifs presenting the word Allah highlights the same heart-shaped knot reminiscent of the dragon bodies. Of significance is also the use of architectural motifs of niches and spandrels, where such apotropaic devices were generally placed. The magical quality of the panel is further amplified by the trilobed niche pattern, which not only resonates with the dragon bodies as seen with the Mar Benam, but also finds resemblances in seals and amulets. For instance, this black volcanic stone, which likely functioned as a seal, depicts the same 
phrase from the Quran in an identical style. Under the arch is the word Allah topped with a knot motif. I've also found carnelian seals in the British Museum con collection that employ similar motifs. Thus far, I've illustrated that the knots and patterns on the Nurid stucco decoration are identical to the iconography of serpentine bodies in the Jazeera region. My argument rests on the premise that because the knotted dragon bodies uh, possess apotropaic power, the Nurid stucco in its likeness must therefore also embody the same powerful properties. My next question is, if, the two things, if two things look alike, that is, there is visual similarity, does that also mean that the analogical image takes on the intrinsic quality of the original source? In this case, do the patterns necessarily become magical because they possess an analogical relationship with serpentine bodies? The creating of associations and analogies in this way was a light, is a leitmotif of medieval Islamic aesthetics, especially between 11th and the 13th centuries. Margaret Graves has meticulously illustrated the analogies or illusions that exist between monumental architecture and three-dimensional plastic arts during this time. In medieval Arabic poetics and literary criticism, especially from the 11th century onwards, indirect expressions such as simile, metaphor, imitation, illusion, dominated the aesthetic sensibilities of this time. In this so-called new school of literary criticism, numerous terminologies were employed for indirect expression, illustrating the surge and dynamism in the field. There are two terms that, that come close to the use of the word metaphor that I have incorporated in the title of my talk. The first is istiara, literally meaning borrowing, this is the idea of making something become something else in the mind of the beholder. That is, seeing something as something else. And a related term is tahil, make-believe or imaginative creation. That is, making one imagine something as something else. Both can be grouped under the analogy-based sense of a metaphor found in the works of Abdel Kahir al-Jurjani, the famed 11th century grammarian and literary theorist. This metaphorical logic also prevails in the discussion of Aristotelian poetics by philosophers such as Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, as demonstrated by Guru Nejipolu, and more recently by Lara Harb in her work on Arabic poetics. According to Harb, associating one with the other was a means of stimulating the imagination. As a result, the reader or the viewer undergoes a process of mental discovery, thereby evoking a sense of wonder. The more rare, unfamiliar, or novel the comparison is, the greater the wonder. We can begin to see these analogies in the visual culture of the 12th and 13th centuries as well. The silver and copper inlaid candlestick, likely a product of Mosuli workshops, feature a pair of confronted dragons in the central chevron band. Their wide open mouths and prominent heart-shaped knotted bodies are here juxtaposed with the chevron bands filled with tightly knit scrolls and vegetal motifs that are executed in a mirroring style. The placement and the deliberate visual similarities created through this design invites the viewer to forge association between the two motifs. Doing so dissolves any distinction bet between the vegetal scroll and the knotted dragon. The vegetal scrolls become the dragons. A similar analogical dialogue is created in this wooden panel with two intersecting medallions within its frame, likely part of a door. In the first image, the word Muhammad is repeated five times, the base of the let letters and the ligatures forming a five-pointed star. In the second image, a series of strokes mimicking the image above form an identical five-pointed stars. The strokes appear to look like letters, but they're clearly not letters. A, metho a methodical juxtaposing of the images in this way works to create a visual analogy, making the two images indistinguishable. In texts relating to scientific and literary knowledge, Exaggerated analogies become a way to not only elucidate meaning, rather the comparison itself is a goal. 
For instance, the illuminated and illustrated Kitab al which presents a series of recipes for curing snake poison, explicates the recipe of the antidote through analogies with the court of the king. The scribe discusses the ingredients of the recipe in the following way. Honey, the binding ingredient in the recipe, is described as the trenches and courts of the city. Hedachrum tablets, which are a combination of several simple drugs with an aromatic quality, are described as the gatekeepers and guards of the palace. Viper flesh tablets, the main ingredient of the theriac recipe, takes the place of the king. Like the king, the other ingredients of this recipe revolved around the viper flesh tablets. Skila tablets, which are composed of sea onion, are understood as the youth or the young men who surround the king at all times, protecting him and entertaining him. The matbukh, which is a cooked snake flesh, takes the place of the slaves of the king. The analogies might appear far-fetched, but that is precisely the point. Coming back to the stucco panel in question, I propose understanding the script-based patterns as part of the metaphorical trend of the period. The striking visual similarity between the knotted dragon bodies and the script patterns suggest an attempt by the, of the craftsman to guise the Arabic script within the prevalent aesthetic outlook. That is, the visual similarity was evoked to make something become something else. The words are designed in, a way, in such a way so as to bring to mind the long, coiled, serpentine bodies. But the word patterns not only remind one of the dragon bodies, but I argue they also become the dragon bodies and therefore possess the attributes of the serpent dragon. The apotropaic significance is equally present in the labyrinthic design. The intricate interlacing pattern understood as a demon trap in both Islamic and Byzantine contexts. The idea rests on the premise that the complex web attracts the gaze of the demon or the evil spirits, who are then fixated and caught within the pattern, thus safeguarding the individuals and community from evil. The other important element of this decoration is the presence of pious names and phrases, Allah, Muhammad, Rashidun, Caliph, Sifas, and the term Fasayak Fika Hum Allah, that are often associated with Baraka or blessings. This ontological understanding of the word, that is a visual script, not only not merely a signifier, but as possessing the power and attributes of the name or idea signified, is well established, that is script had a performative role. The practice is common in late antique and medieval Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean and can be seen also with Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew scripts. For instance, the, the Greek word hygia, health, and the name of the saint appears on, a pilgrimage, on pilgrimage clay tokens, especially associated with the 6th century Saint Simeon the Stylite, where ingesting the token, and hence the words, was a pharmacological remedy or cure-all for physical and mental ailments. Magical association of words, especially benedictory phrases, become a common feature of amulets and amuletic jewelry in the Islamic world, as seen in this wedding armband wishing the bride happiness and well-being, surur wa sa'ada, through an inscription touching her body. In materials related to magic, one of, the notice, one of the noticeable characteristics of script is its rendition in archaic and undecipherable words, deliberately challenging the reader. One gets the sense that there is an inverse relationship between the readability of text and their magical potentiality. That is, the unreadability of text, in fact, augments the efficacy of the object. This idea is very much in line with, with the aesthetic sensibility of wonder in Arabic poetics discussed earlier, wherein the wondrous was generated through figures of speech that were deliberately unfamiliar, strange, or imaginative. The heightened illegibility of words becomes almost synonymous with magical materials, and I want to highlight a few examples demonstrating the visual performance of script as an amplification of their supernatural significance. A good example is a series of incantation bowls from late antique and medieval Mesopotamia, attributed between the 5th and the 8th centuries. The unglazed earthenware bowls feature Aramaic script or pseudoscript in a series of circular patterns, often appearing as concentric circles or a spiral pattern in the interior of the bowls. 
For the purposes of repelling demons and evil spirits, the text inscribed on the bowls generally include names of deities and spells for the protection of one's home and livelihood. The bowls were placed upside down in the four corners of the house, the density of the words designed to entrap the malevolent beings. In some of the bowls, like the one you see on the right here, demons are also depicted in the center of the bowl, circumscribed by the script in order to visually illustrate their capture. Recent scholarship has demonstrated that the inscriptions on these bowls were not merely remnants of oral spells. Rather, the efficacy was equally contingent on the visuality of script. They were designed to be viewed and to be seen rather than read. No wonder that many of these bowls liberally employ pseudoscript. A similar role is evident in magical materials from medieval Islam. A rock crystal amulet employs the phrase as seen in the stucco panel to invoke God's protection, but in a linear Kufic style and in reverse. The illegible or pseudo linear Kufic script on this, on this clay um, uh, amulet for scorpions contributes to the apotropaic nature of the object, protection from the dangers of scorpions or malicious spirits more generally. The earliest extant magic medicinal bowl is dedicated to Nuruddin Zangi, the patron also of the mosque in Mosul where the stucco decoration was placed. The bowl has illegible script in undulating patterns, likely carrying the names of God, as well as images of intertwined dragons, among other magical vocabulary, seen better in this image from the, uh, of the bowl from the David collection. The bowls worked when the afflicted individual imbibed the liquid that was charged by the inscriptions and the imagery. The inscriptions tell us that these bowls could be used to cure a wide variety of ailments, from snake and scorpion bites to painful labor pains, colic, as well as evil eye. It is unlikely that Nuruddin Zangi or members of his family would have been able to decipher or read the script on this bowl. The illegibility of letter forms and the circuitous designs that toggle the boundaries of human comprehension are precisely the characteristics that elevate script into the realm of the magical. These examples also demonstrate that magical efficacy is not dependent on readability. I'm interested in thinking about this sort of visual performance of script and their possible meanings in another group of objects from Mosul, metalwork. While my research on inscriptions on inlaid metalwork is still a work in progress, I wanted to provide a cursory insight here because they're so closely tied to the discussions thus far. Many of the silver uh, inlaid objects from 13th century Mosul, such as this pen box, employ a variety of script styles. I'm particularly interested in the knotted Kufic style script, which is featured on the inner back wall of this pen box and which I have been unable to decipher. In this script style, the vertical segments of the letters are elongated at set intervals and populated with an interlacing design that runs across the text. As can be seen in the drawing from the pen box, the letter forms are visually less significant with most of the emphasis placed on the interlacing features of the script. The labyrinthic design creates a deliberate visual obstacle to the reading of the script, transforming script into pseudoscript, even if the characters are in fact legible words. Just as the knotted letters on the stucco decoration may be understood as metaphors of dragon bodies, I propose rethinking the knotted script as metaphors for text. And by that, I mean that one instinctively understands these images and as meaningful text, even if they're unable to decipher the contents of the image. Although knotted inscriptions form a prominent feature of middle objects from Mosul, there is a positive research examining the content of the knotted inscriptions or their sociocultural significance. The knotted inscriptions have often been dismissed by art historians as they generally do not carry any historical information. They almost always contain phrases of benediction or supplication, such as saada, happiness, baraka, divine blessings, alayz wa likbal, honor and prosperity, and yum, good luck or fortune. These have been discussed to some extent in Khorasani metalwork by Malikian Shirvani. 
He notes that the knotted phrases often use a shorthand script to present a word that may be challenging for the untrained eye, and that may be the case here. A cursory look at some contemporaneous examples as that of the David Collection pen box reveals that similar visual forms are being employed across a range of metal objects. I have isolated knotted inscriptions on two other inlaid metal objects. On the top is the inscription on a candlestick base attributed to Badruddin Lulu. The text flanks the medallion on the object's central band. Below that is the inscription that circumscribes the widest part of the Hamburg era. And finally, the David Collection pen box. The similarity of visual is apparent and suggests one of two things. Either that these were, were a set of words that were deemed worthy and perhaps even magical during this period, and are hence employed in many of these objects. I think that is likely the case here, and we may be able to, for instance, read the last word rendered across these three objects as yum, lucky, fortunate, or auspicious. And what we see is not only the word, but also the way in which the script and the letter forms are rendered, whether legible or not, which suggests a copying or a replication of a visual model. The presence of a visual model, in fact, seems very possible, given that many of the objects under consideration were made in Mosul, and perhaps even in the same workshop. What is also very interesting is that many of the knotted inscriptions found in Mosuli objects are products of the workshop of Ahmed al-Zaki and his assistant Ibn Jaldak, laying the groundwork for another extended study of Mosuli metalwork. In examining a variety of materials where script and knotting intersect, the stucco panel of Anuri Mosque stands out as a unique and exceptional piece of craftsmanship. The stucco decoration also makes a strong visual statement when seen in the context of the mosque space. With respect to the dating of the panel, given the lack of textual or archaeological evidence on any additions to the mosque by Badruddin Lulu in the 13th century, I consider the stucco decoration to be contemporaneous with the original construction and decorative program of the mosque by Nuruddin Zangi in 1172. Nuruddin Zangi is known for his military zeal against the Crusades in the 12th century, and the epigraphic program of many of his endowments showcase his commitment to the jihad. The great mosque in Mosul was commissioned by Nuruddin towards the end of his life, a period described by historians as Nuruddin's turn towards religious piety. As such, inscriptions concerning jihad are absent from this mosque, which instead focus on the basic tenets of the faith, such as prayer and virtue. In addition to this um, panel, the mosque uh, of Nuruddin Zangi is also replete with pious Quranic inscriptions within the sanctuary, all of which are inscribed in a linear, cursive, and legible script. Oh, the first set of inscriptions appear on marble bands with black inlay that were thought to have been flanking the mihrab and thus seen at eye level. The second set appears on the, on the capitals of squat octagonal columns, enumerating a series of continuous verses from the Quran. The Asr Taba, who is one of the few scholars to have discussed this mosque at length, takes a visual clarity and ease of the readability of inscriptions to make two points. First, he claims that the cursive style of script corresponded to the so-called Sunni revival and championed the Sunni orthodoxy of Nur ad-Din. Second, that the readability of script was conducive to the demographics of Mosul, where there were large groups of new Christian convert, converts who would have been able to easily read the text. Attributing the stucco panel as part of the original decorative um, scheme rather than a later addition as discussed by Taba challenges both of those claims. The knotted and interlacing motif, motifs of script on the stucco panel produces a stark visual contrast to the cursive legible script seen within the space, rethinking the connection between the style of script and Nur ad-Din's Sunni orthodoxy. Stephanie Mulder has demonstrated Nur ad-Din's orthodoxy to also include popular piety within its domains, particularly his endowments to Alad shrines and pilgrimage sites in 12th century Syria. The expansion of popular piety during this period is also corroborated by the magic medicinal bowl 
with the circuitous and magical script that was dedicated to Nur ad-Din. The addition of this stucco panel during this, his lifetime further highlights the prevalence of popular piety in Orthodox spaces. The theme of popular piety is particularly relevant given the context of Mosul, where Christians, both Nestorians and Jacobites, constituted a large, mi large minor minority. The Muslim Christian syncretism in Mosul, discussed by scholars such as Bas Snelders and Ethel Walper, can best be seen in the plethora of pilgrimage sites devoted to prophets and saints. Mosul is home to the shrine and mosque of Prophet Jonah and Prophet Georges, also known as St. George. It is a site of um, Prophet Noah, as well as of several Christian mon monasteries. These sites were epicenters of miraculous cures, healing, and personal protection. The wonders, miracles, and curative properties of pilgrimage sites is also apparent in the works of Al-Harawi, a native of Mosul in the 12th century, who enumerates the sites in his Kitab al-Isharat. It is perhaps not a coincidence that a large portion of the earliest extant objects relating to magic stem from this period. The hidden supernatural world capable of affecting terrestrial life was thus an important feature of the medieval imagination. Moreover, the prevalence of magical ideas and beliefs, beliefs testify to a religious experience that was more personal and more immediate. And I suggest that the script patterns on the stucco panel exemplify this popular culture of Mosul and the Jazeera. They represent embodied knowledge that was both personal and accessible to the medieval viewer, especially recent converts, more so than the legible cursive script seen on the marbles and octagonal columns of the Anuri Mosque. One need not have to read the inscriptions on the stucco panel. The deliberate visual metaphors on the panel constituted embodied forms of apotropaea well known within the cultural context of Mosul. Thank you. <laughs>